Okay, this morning I want to speak to you. I speak, I've spoken to you a few sessions, uh, Sundays on the face-to-face experience with God. And it's like this thing doesn't want to leave me, although I feel I want to move on. And I want to actually speak to you this morning about the authority of the kingdom. The authority of the kingdom. And from a position of authority, but the authority of the kingdom. Uh, and I, I'm going to touch again on the face-to-face thing, but maybe just show you something a little bit more, and then uh, hopefully we can conclude this today. You can never conclude the message. It will always be ongoing because it's a revelation line upon line, um, but you study it for yourself further. But there's something that is absolutely vital to the kingdom of God that I believe that the Lord is bringing us into the reality of in this season. And the reason it's vital, the reason it's vital, is because if it doesn't happen, they are, then we are simply those that are trying to portray the kingdom of God through our philosophies or through the words or our words. Paul says something in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. He says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and power. It's a loaded verse. And I still believe this is something that we have to see manifest in the church in a greater measure. So God's plan would absolutely be an absolute fail. It would be chaos. It would be absolutely nothing more than just a hollow sound if God's kingdom and that is speaking of a people, are not going to come into the reality that the kingdom of God will be manifest and that the, because the prayers of Jesus will be answered. He prayed, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So that kingdom must manifest. And that kingdom is manifesting and that kingdom will manifest. That means there will be no more variants Listen to my words. There will be no, no, no more a different dimensions. That as much as it's in heaven, so it will also be on earth. That's what Jesus prayed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now the word be done is actually means, it is actually is become. It means become on earth as it is in heaven. To the same degree, if you will. To the same level, if you will. That the kingdom of God is manifesting in the heavens to that same degree, the kingdom of God needs to manifest with authority and power on the earth. The same dimension, the kingdom of God will manifest on the earth. What that means is, it is not going to be, listen to my words and I'm choosing them carefully. It is not going to be as such a signs and wonders demonstration. Although we will see that. Let's just hear what I'm saying. As much as going to be the kingdom of God manifest, if everything that we have spoken of so far, far, and if everything that we have taught and everything that we have preached and every revelation we've described is nothing more than just man's philosophy or intelligence, even as wonderful as the revelation has been, if that is all we have, then the kingdom of God is a failure. The reason for that is because the world is not interested in man's philosophy. Not. The world is not interested in the enticing words of man's wisdom. How clever we are with our words and our semantics. They are looking, watch my words, they are looking for the evidence. They are looking for the evidence of the demonstration of the kingdom of God manifest in the earth. That is not talking simply that we will pray for the sick and they will be healed. It's not so simply talking about we'll cast out demons. It's not simply speaking of we will raise the dead. If you read the Hebrews, you will see that all these things are simply but the foundation of the kingdom come. That's not it. 
is but part of it. It's, a, it's an outflow, but that is not what God is after. You'll see just now. And I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is a state of being that is so authoritative that it will be much greater than anything that we've ever experienced thus far. It will be beyond anything we can possibly understand with our intellectual minds. And it will, and it will absolutely be a state of being that is demonstrative of the kingdom. Not only will it, be, will it be the releasing of the power that will bring about deliverance and healing, it will also be a release of power of that state of being that will be God. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not just the manifestations of gifts. The apostles in the days of Jesus walked in an experience that would be an example or a first fruits to all of us. John was picked up and gone into the Spirit on the day of the Lord, and he saw the glories that are to come. And he wrote them down as the revelation of Jesus Christ in the revelations. And then also Paul had an experience where he was caught up into the third heaven, and, he, and, 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 and the things that he saw, he said, were unspeakable. And actually, it was unlawful for him to describe them. They were beyond words, therefore. But you witness in their lives the authority that these men walked in. They walked into a position of boldness. They walked into a state of being that was so authoritative. It was as obviously a result of the union they had with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of the union that they had, they walked into a reality of a state of being that was so powerful and so authoritative. Also, we have to see there's nowhere in scriptures that the disciples, the apostle Paul, or any of those that were leaders in that day were in a place where they had to plead with the Father for the sake of someone else's deliverance or healing. You'll never find it. Never pleaded. They, they operated from a different dimension. They walked with authority in a state of being, a state of boldness, a position of rulership, that they simply spoke the word and it would manifest. Paul, who had a thorn in his side, asked the Lord three times to deliver him. He was able to walk in a state of being even with the thorns in his side, when he saw the lame man, the Bible reads, he discerned that this man was a man of God of, or of faith and commanded him to rise up and walk. And immediately the man stood up and he walked. Peter, that was considered Simon, a man of mixture, I'm going to get to this one just now, walked to the lame man on the steps, watch this, of the temple called Beautiful. Listen carefully. It is describing the temple as beautiful. And so much of what we have seen thus far in the church has been a beautiful temple while the people at the door are lame. And it has been presented in a glorious expression that we have. That is a facade of beauty when in reality the people cannot walk. Come on, take that. And he came to the layman and he said, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have I give unto thee. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And the man rose up, he leaped up with joy. And we find that Jesus being the brightness of the glory he was the one that came and was the living expression of the Father. He was also the entryway, if you will, into this divine authority that follows. And when he said to them, carry your cross and follow me, as much as we have perceived that to mean that you are to be crucified and crucify yourself and crucify the flesh, hang on, hang on. We're not staying there. And as much as we are to die daily, 
And there's a side to the cross that has to deal with death. But there's also a side of the cross that brings resurrection. So, as much as there's a dying to self, by the dying of the self, there is the releasing of power. We have read that Elijah came and he took the boy that, that, that was sick, that actually died, and he put his body on top of the boy, and he breathed into his mouth, and the body of the boy start to live again, or the boy start to live again. We read that Elijah, who, was, who died, is the same Elijah, who died as a sick man. This is the Dichotomus. His very bones raised the dead. And it is mind-boggling when we begin to understand that the Lord is bringing us into a place of authority as a result of our union and into a position of boldness that we will be living epistles. And what that means is you will not only be able to simply quote the word by memorizing it, but you will be the word manifested. So when you speak it, it will have creative power. That's what I'm talking about from a position of authority. The kingdom of God has to come. We have to see these things in the lives of the believers. Come on, say amen. The Bible says in John 15 verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you because he's abiding in you and you are abiding in him. His word is abiding in you. His word has become your standard. His word has become your measure. His word is becoming your living expression and it is him in you, and it is His will saying, yes. Whatever His will is saying, guess what? Will be. Now, in 1 Corinthians 30 verse 12, speaks of the resemblance, we go back to that face-to-face -face thing. Resemblance of the recognition of looking in the mirror. And I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. And I'm going to give you the original text in between or part of the scripture. It says this. For now we see in a mirror dimly. It's an enigma or, un, or an unclear view. But then face to face. Or watch this. It's actually face into face. I'm going to explain it to you just now. Now I know or I'm aware in part. But then I shall know just as I also am known. What he is speaking of is that, that right now we see through a mirror. So when you are looking at the mirror, what are you beholding in the mirror? Your own reflection. But you are beholding through a mirror darkly, which means you are not beholding clearly. You are not completely clear on what you are seeing because right now we see in part. So when the then is fulfilled, because it says then, when it's fulfilled, we look into the mirror darkly, we are looking into a mirror, and we are only seeing a reflection that is not completely clear. But the day is going to come when we are going to look into that mirror and we are going to behold something. And what we are going to behold is a reflection. And the reflection is that we are now looking Face to face. And the word face to face, as I said, means face into face. It's not going to be me looking at the face that's in front of me. I'm going to describe this to you. Remember, he's in you, and you are in him. It's not you. We had this picture of where we stand, and we look at the mirror face to face, and eventually you see Jesus being the reflection. No, that's not what it says. It's not from the front, but it's from the back. Does that make sense? It means this. That then one day, when we look, we're going to look through his face. 
That's the face to face. Face in the face. Not this way. But it's when you look, you don't see yourself. You see yourself through the eyes of him. Face into face. That's actually what it means. The Bible speaks very clearly that now we see in part, I only am aware of it, but then face into face. When? Then. When as soon. The then means when as soon. So, when as soon as you recognize the face, you will see clearly. And now read the, the, uh, the latter part of the verse. I'm going to read it again. And it's more, and I'm going to give it to you more correctly according to the Greek. It says this, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. When as soon as I will recognize as I am recognized. You see, it's, just, it's coming into an awareness. It's coming into a state of being. That's what it is all about, the face to face. Right now we see through a mirror, through an enigma, through a confusion that is not totally clear. But the day is going to come as soon as you know it. It's not speaking of some futuristic date and time. As soon as you know it, as soon as it's illuminated into you, as soon as you recognize it, you're going to recognize as you are recognized. That's what the Bible says. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled faces, then your face will become unveiled because you are looking through his face. Okay? Beholding is as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. So it's one image. So into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we are beholding him in the mirror, we are changed from glory to glory into the same image by the Spirit of God. As soon as you see, you will recognize as you are recognized. It is by the Spirit that we behold. It is by the Spirit that we behold and we are changed. And we are changed from glory to glory. Now watch this. Jesus was the last Adam, we know that, and he's the second man. You know that, 1 Corinthians 15? But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. From since by man came death, watch this now, but by man, didn't say Jesus, but by man also came the resurrection of the dead. I'll explain just now. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So the first Adam all died. The last Adam, all being made alive. He is the last Adam, but he's the second man. Listen carefully. He was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. Therefore, he was 100% God, and he was 100% man. We have always identified and recognized and glorified the side of him that is 100% God, because we all know who Jesus is. Watch this now. But let's look carefully who he is as the son of man. As the last Adam, the second man. When we recognize that he is the last Adam, that in his nature, watch this now, in his nature, he completed the old Adamic nature. He was then or became the second man. In other words, he was there for the beginning of a new creation man. And he was on earth operating in God. Bringing about the manifestation of the kingdom of God in a reality. He did not speak with enticing words of man's wisdom. He demonstrated as a man. The kingdom of God. None of us could relate to it if he expressed the kingdom of God as God. It would have been impossible. Because he will say, we will say, well, he's Jesus Christ. Well, whom uh, am I to contend then with God? It's impossible. But he did not express, this is what we have to understand. He did not express the kingdom of God as God. He expressed the kingdom of God as 100% man. 100% God. 
He was the living manifestation. Or, or if you will, he was the visible expression of the invisible God. He was God in man. There you go. He was God in man. That's the face into face. He was God in man. Absolutely, he was divine, incarnated God. He was the Father. He was the personified, divine, glorious man or a glorious God in man. But in everything that he did in the earth, listen to me, everything that he did on the earth, he did it as a man. He was birthed as a baby. He was disciplined and grew up as a child. He was wearing nappies and diapers and drank mother's milk. Believe it. He was wiped and he was cleaned. He went through all the things that we would go through. And even to a greater extent because he was tempted in every single way, the Bible says. He experienced the depths of hell and the heights of heaven. But the thing that the Lord began to show me here is that I did not come to you in some kind of a whirlwind of fire. I did not come to you and raise up Lazarus as some kind of windstorm or some kind of supernatural manifestation. I come to you as a man in sandals. I came to you as a man I did not have a place to live. I walked in the streets. I came as a man. I was not born in a nice house like many were. I was born in a manger. Just think of it. So he even went to the lower degree. But he was a living manifestation of the kingdom of God as man. In Psalm 8 verse 4 it says, What is a man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. What is man that you have decided to do this in him? That's actually what it's saying. Now we know the apostle with the first fruits are the first fruits. Now you find that you find James being a half brother of Jesus. He must have had a real time in the house because he slept in the same house, raised in the same family, was spanked by the same mother and same father, half brother of Jesus. And he had to believe, this James had to believe that this man that he calls his brother was divinely birthed. He had to believe it. Although he saw him in the natural. He had to believe that this boy, his older brother, was birthed by God. In the latter days of his ministry, he was considered as one of the greatest apostles. He ruled with such authority and such wisdom that he has such a position of recognition in the church. And you notice in Scripture, they do not talk much about him being the brother of Jesus. They talked about James, the apostle. To be his brother, you think, would have an influence on him. No. No, he had to change. He had to realize who he was. Just like Peter, who was Simon, and Paul, who was Saul. I'm going somewhere. God showed us through men that lived lives that most of us would not think of living. These men walk in reality of boldness that they would, that they would, would have not prayed, Dear Lord Jesus, please heal this man. Yeah, they just heal the people with great boldness and authority. We have to understand, I'm not in any way minimizing that we still pray. We are still seeing part. But we have to understand that as we are beholding him face to face, the question is, what are we beholding? We have to begin to behold what is man that thou art mindful of him. What is the mystery of this gospel? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's no longer going to just be hope. It is going to be glory. And so we begin to see that as we behold face to face and we are changed into the same image, what are you changing into? You are changing into this 100% man and 100% God who is being changed into the same image from glory to glory. And it doesn't mean that you're going to become God. It means that He is going to be all there is in you that he needs to be in you. Did you hear what I'm saying? Vital difference. As we behold, we are changed. 
And what we are changed into is the glory because we are beholding is the glory of the Lord. Therefore, we are being changed from glory to glory, even into the same image by the Spirit. So when we are being changed into the same image, what you are being changed into is the kingdom of God personified. And it's not going to be a time when we come and say, Lord, in the, in the name of Jesus, would you please heal this person? Will you please do this? No, it's going to be rise up and walk in Jesus' name. And you will find that the disciples and the apostles of, and the apostles of Scripture did not plead, but they commanded and things happened. And when I say command, I'm not talking about commanding God. They commanded the creative word of God. Do you hear the difference? They simply spoke things into existence. And it was so. In 2 Peter 1, listen very closely to the introduction of the epistle of Peter. This is now becoming more close to home where you and I are at the moment. Because he makes it clear and how he identifies himself. And there's something that is hidden in these few verses that's wonderful that we have to realize that God is taking us and on this journey, exact same journey, where we are transformed and changed from glory to glory. I'm reading out of the CLV Bible, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. It says this. Listen how he introduces himself. Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. The introduction of the name Simon before Peter and slave before apostle give us a clue to the character of the second epistle of Peter. Now, the emphasis is laid on practice rather than the precept. It is concerned with the living, the living out of, or the living or the manifestation of, rather than the learning, I'm going somewhere. Because he's identifying right with his opening the progression of his life and his journey from glory to glory from Simon to Peter. He's telling you where he comes from. From Simon to Peter and from a slave to an apostle. This man. And we think of Saul to Paul. It is describing a progression, or here it comes, or a change of nature. Hallelujah. A change of nature. Jacob and Israel, same concept. And Peter's writing the second epistle. He starts the introduction of it. He starts with Simon first and then Peter, slave and then apostle. And he's showing you the change that is taking place in his life on this journey. Do you see that? immediately is giving us a clue to the character of this epistle that he's about to write. He has given us a secret of what this book is about and he's describing here the change that has taken place in his life and he's bringing about the reality of the living of it rather than the learning of it. Now, the recognition of God or the knowledge of God uh, were we see, where we see so, so many times, it seems like it is one of his favorite statements in this whole book, in the book of Peter, where he talks about the knowledge of God the whole time. We read it in several scriptures in 2 Peter 1, 8 and 2 Peter 2, 20, where, the emphasis, where he emphasizes through the knowledge of him. Let me just read those scriptures. 2 Peter 1, 8 says, For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says in 2 Peter 2.20, for, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world to the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Now, in 2 Peter 1, uh, 1, 1 to 4, let me read this as well. Simon Peter, New King James, a bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm going to explain just now, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge. Now, this knowledge is when you come face to face, the recognition 
is that recognition. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge, the recognition of God and of our Jesus, our Lord. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, the recognition of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given us to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers, 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 partakers of the divine nature, the divine godly nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Now, the word knowledge means, it's the word epignosis in the Greek. It means recognition. That's the face-to-face when you look in, this, in the mirror. Recognizing eventually. Recognition, by implication, full discernment, full discernment, comes from the root word epignosco. It means full discernment to become what you have been fully acquainted with. Hallelujah. That's the knowledge. That's the recognition when you look into the mirror. The recognition. So it's the full, it's a, it's full discernment to become what you have been fully acquainted with. Hallelujah. And the word fully means a relationship of distribution. That's where you're full. Now you can distribute. So, we see that Paul is more concerned with living, the living of it. And he shows us that by this recognition, grace and peace is multiplied. Through the knowledge, the recognition is the power that leads to life and godliness. It's coming into the awareness of who you truly are. It's time that we should discover who we truly are, not just man, but 100% man having the nature of God, 100% God nature manifesting through your life to the extent that God wants to, to, to manifest it. So, he shows that by this recognition, grace and peace are multiplied. And through this knowledge is the power, through this knowledge is the power that leads to life and godliness. That's what he says. So 2 Peter 1.4 as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life, that is Zoe life, and godliness, watch this, through the knowledge, let me, let me explain that, through the recognition of Him, through the fully, through fully discerning, becoming through the full acquaintance, a relationship ready for distribution, through that knowledge we are able to live out the life and the godliness that He has already given us by His divine power of Him who called us by glory and virtue. You want me to read that again? I just put the definitions of, of the word knowledge and the root word knowledge together. It says this, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life, Zoe, and godliness, through the knowledge, through the recognition of Him, through the full discerning, becoming through the full acquaintance, a relationship ready for distribution, through the knowledge or the recognition, we are now able to live out the life and the godliness that He has already given us, by His divine power of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Oh, this is, you've got to study this. The word virtue at a day means the strength. It also means this, manliness. It means excellence. And the literal meaning of the word is to be a man. Think of it. His manifestation. I thought, Lord, your manliness. Yes, He was 100% man. That would lead us to his strength as a man by divine power. It's time to grow up. That's what he is saying. It's time to become. He was that 100% manly man. That's the virtue. Strength and excellence was found in him. That is the man that God wants you now to realize and recognize who you are. 2 Timothy 3, 5. Okay, I'm going to give you the opposite of the scripture. Look at this in the Bible. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In other words, having the form without the essence. And how many of you are tired of just having the form 
and you are now desiring to have the essence. So we will all sing apart until the fullness come. And the fullness come as soon as you see, as soon as I become fully acquainted, recognizing through the fellowship and the union with this man, where I discern him completely and I recognize him through the knowledge of him. In other words, through the, 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 the recognition of the full discernment of who this 100% man was. In other words, through this recognition and the full discernment, through the becoming or the acquaintance, ready a relationship for distribution. That he will lead us because he has already given us everything that we need. It boggles my mind. Now watch this. Second Peter 1, 3. As his divine power has given to us what? All things. All things. All things that pertain to life, Zoe, and godliness. Now in 2 Corinthians 5, begins, he begins to describe something that is absolutely glorious that we need to exercise in our walk. Peter is describing in his book the change that had already taken place in his life. And this is the same Peter that while Jesus spoke to him, there's a change that takes place. Watch this now. It's the same Peter that while Jesus spoke to him and he said, this divine revelation that you just received uh, of that I am the Christ, you did not receive this by flesh and blood, but you received it by the Father. Remember this? That Jesus is the Son of the living God. And just a few verses further, Jesus turned to the same man that had this awesome revelation of who Jesus was. The Christ, the Son of the living. He says to him, he says to him, get behind me, Satan. The same man. This is the same people, Peter that would deny him. And also the same people, Peter that after the resurrection jumped out of the boat to go to him. This guy went through the extreme changes. And how many of you can relate with Peter? Uh, when you meant good, you find out that the devil has had your, hold of your mind. And, and you will learn like Peter through being praised and through being rebuked. Both. So this guy has absolute authority and what he, he, he just, has just described. That the God has given to us all power pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. He had to realize who he truly was, although in his natural, he failed himself and those around about him many times. But he had to come to the acquaintance, the recognition, the full knowledge of this strength of man uh, that's on the inside of him of who he truly was. He begins to exercise something in his own walk with the Lord. When you read his writings, you will see, you'll begin to see that one of his strong emphasis is to life, is to live the life and not just to talk it. Now, one of the greatest truths that has absolutely set me, me free is that God is a God that's going to reconcile creation. I want to touch on something and I don't want to go into deep, but just listen to what I'm saying. This God, it seems like, how is this possible? Simon Peter. Saul, Paul, men of authority with such a background of bad nature, character, being transformed into the image, shows us that that process is absolutely available and possible. And they become so bold because they realize and they start to tap in the strength of the virtue of the manliness of this man that's on the inside of them. And they have manifested with great power and authority in the earth. Now watch this. This is God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 to 20. Now all things are of God. Say all things. Who has reconciled. Say reconciled. Us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Is your answer, Mother? Listen now. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. There is absolutely a bundle of truth that's contained within these verses. Where Paul begins to write that all things are of God and was reconciled. All things was reconciled. 
all things, say all things, was reconciled. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now watch this. You can never teach reconciliation. You could only reconcile people through ministering reconciliation. God has given us the word of reconciliation. Listen, listen, listen carefully. It is such a good news that creation will come to find out and the church is going to be shocked when they realize that God is not going to lose his creation, but he's going to reconcile them. Fasten your seatbelts. Boggles my mind. And you will come to the reality where you will recognize that reconciliation is not some futuristic event that is going to take place. Reconciliation is a word that has been placed within our hearts already. And it's a ministry that you are to live as a witness that God was in Christ. 100% man, 100% God. Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them. Listen to this. If man can cause you through his conduct and behavior to pull you down to his level as, at the, as the first Adam, to that nature, you have yet to receive the word of reconciliation. You may have the theology on it. You may have the revelation of it. But if man is able to pull you down through his conduct and behavior into his first Adamic nature, and you react to that first Adamic nature, like many of us do, and you live out that first Adamic nature, you are not a witness that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself and not imputing. Therefore, the ministry of reconciliation is not simply something that I tell people about. The hell is not forever, and the word forever means it's not eternal. And we find out that the word forever in the original language means an age. It's a duration of time. A man that will reject Christ will definitely go to hell. And they do not want to be there one minute. So do not minimize hell. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a condition. We have to preach love and make sure that we make clear that hell is a place, listen to me, of a changing fire. But the fact is, I'm going to give you scripture today. But the fact is that once the fire has done its changing, everything, every knee is going to bow. And I love this verse. I've got the scripture. Revelation 20 verse 13, it says this. Death and hell delivered up the dead people which were in them. Hell will not be able to hold on to God's creation that he has already reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. And there's something that we have to get hold of because God wants to give us this authority. I love this. He says, give them up. Give them up. Not down. Give them up. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And then he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation is that you will not, you will not, listen to me, this is the ministry of reconciliation. You will not impute their trespasses unto them. You will be a witness that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That is why a Simon could become a Peter. A soul could become a Paul. They recognize this, which means you will not hold them guilty. You will walk in a state of reconciliation. You will reconcile them. Reconciliation means you bring them into the understanding of what has already taken place, of their original position in Christ. You have been given the word of reconciliation as ambassadors for Christ in Christ's stead. Be reconciled to God. When we think of this word in Christ's stead, we start recognizing, watch this now, watch this now, that God is not looking to send Jesus again. God is not looking to send Jesus again. 
He's looking to send him again as 100% man and 100% God in us. The first time he came, he came as a savior. But how many of you know he has been glorified, sitting at the right hand of God the Father? And now coming, he now comes and he's coming to manifest himself in the midst of his saints. And creation is not travailing and waiting for Jesus. Creation is not travailing and waiting for the Messiah. They are not in travail waiting for the birth of Christ. Creation is in travail waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God in Christ's stead, reconciling them. Be they reconciled. Think of that. John 1, 16. And of his fullness we, we have all received and grace for grace. The very state of our of, of our being people of the Lord is in Christ's stead. And that is what we have to understand. And that is vital. Christ's stead, why? To be reconciled. These things are not theology. It's a ministry. And a ministry, watch this now. This ministry is a state of being. In Christ's stead. Why is it that I behold the glory of the Lord as in the mirror being changed from glory to glory? He says, so I can come to the point where I can say, look, I look just like Jesus. I'm, I'm recognized as I'm recognizing him. That is not the point. The point is that we will come to the reality that we are in Christ's stead. That is what will give you authority. And we are being changed from glory to glory, even into the same image, until, until we are beholding and recognizing, we see clearly. And we are recognizing as we are recognized in Christ's death. It is not so I can just look like Jesus and walk like Jesus and maybe sound like Jesus. It is so that I can be in Christ's stead. It's going to be a state of being that's going to cause the kingdom to come. Do you hear what I'm saying? And 2 Corinthians 2 begins to talk about the state of being at the level of forgiveness and reconciling, not appearing their trespasses. That's where it starts. And it really is an elementary level. What I mean by this is it's the beginning of a state of being and walk that is absolutely essential in our walk with God. How many of you realize that you are forgiven by the same measure that you forgive? How many of you realize you are being forgiven is not something that you feel? Now you know He has forgiven you, but how many, you, how many have a problem by forgiving yourself. Now with the same measure you forgive. You are forgiven. And that is the measure of how much you could walk out. This Christ. Because only in the state of being. Or only in the stead of Christ. Are you a reconciler. So it's vital that we see this. In John 20, 21. Then Jesus said to them again. Peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so I send you. Peace be to you. So don't be troubled by this. Big words. As the Father sent me, exactly the same way, even so I send you. Then in John 20, 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He did not say speak in tongues. He did not say raise the dead. He just breathed into them. If Jesus was to personally breathe into you and say to you, receive the Holy Ghost as the Father has sent me to the same degree and the same measure that the Father sent me, so I also sent you. Do you hear what I'm saying? He breathed himself into them. Then he said in John 20, 23, if you forgive the sins, right after that, he says, if you, give, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You know what it's saying? Whosoever sins you release, they are released. Whosoever you do not release, they are retained. That speaks of kingdom authority. 1 John 3, verse 2 to 3. Beloved, now we are children of God and has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know, but we know 
that when he is revealed, that face to face, recognition, knowledge, understanding, when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, the sight as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he's pure. Then 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, the force of the kingdom. Love is the force of the kingdom. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we. Where? In this world. Right here. So, we see that he breathed into them, tells them to receive the Holy Ghost. In Christ's stead, then reconcile them. Not only did he release us from the power of sin and death, but he also gave us the power, actual fact, all the power that pertains unto life and godliness. And then in Christ's stead, he breathed into us the Holy Spirit. And in Christ's stead, he said, be witnesses that God was in Christ reconciling. This is something that must get a hold of our hearts this morning. And once we begin to see in that mirror, the image reflected of the glory of God, and we are changed into that same image, you will come into the reality where the then will be now, not futuristic. And when you used to just be aware, and, and you are now recognized, and, and what used to be Simon to you will now be Peter to you. And where you have used to be a slave, you now step into the dimension of the apostolic. As in Christ's stead, you now become a reconciler with the power to forgive, to change circumstances, to change your own circumstances, to change your finances, to change relationships, to have the power and the authority of God in Christ Jesus in the earth in Christ's stead. Hallelujah. And reconciling even your bank account with the heavens. Come on. And in the power, you have the power in that to release from sin. And I know that this might boggle your mind, but Jesus has already forgiven mankind of all of their sins. He has done it. Past, present, future. Done it. So we are not coming, trying to do what Jesus did because he already has done it. He already took on himself all sin. Of all creation, past, present, and future. And he became the sin offering once and for all, the Bible says. Destroyed sin and released mankind from the penalty of sin. The, and he ascended unto the Father. Came back and he breathed unto us the Holy Ghost. We are no longer orphans. Now we are sons. Like he was a son. And because we are sons... And receive the spirit of adoption, we are also able to cry now, Abba, Father. And now in Christ's stead, we are ministers of reconciliation. But the difference is with the authority of the kingdom of God manifest in the earth. People of the Lord, I pray that it will pierce your heart. Do not hold yourself back from what is you are destined. Because God has a plan for your life. Don't limit the unlimited God in you. Stop looking just at the Christ, but realizing that Christ is in you. And that Christ was in man, 100% manifesting the heavens in the earth. And God is raising up us because we have been reconciled with Him. And, 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 and He has given us all power. And we are changed from glory to glory in that same image that carries the same power, that carries the same authority to release people from their bondages, to release people from circumstances, to change circumstances, heal the sick, deliver, set free, and, 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 and speak words of life, creative words that carries the authority of God because He has blown His Spirit inside of you and you carry the Spirit of God and as God has sent Him, He is now sending us with the same authority to do what the kingdom has come to do in the earth. It is time to demonstrate the kingdom of God like we've never seen it before in our generation. The church has been void of that power because we, we, we don't see ourselves and the state 
and what He has already done for us on the cross of Calvary, the finished work. It's time to look in that mirror again, but face into faces and start to realize that you are changed from glory to glory. Into that same image. Into that same image. Not another image. Into that same image. That is why Simon can become Peter. Ben Winnie became Benjamin. Son of my right hand. God wants to change your nature. But you have to see Him face to face. Face in face. And you are transformed from glory to glory into the same image. Sons of God with authority. That's why Dennis can step into Blattenberg Bay just by stepping every place your foot shall tread and the circumstances, the earth and everything round about it has to respond to the Christ and the authority that's on the inside of you. You don't have to go cry. You don't have to go do funny stuff. Just because you're there and you carry that image and that likeness, the glory of God has come on the scene and nature has to respond to that and change and be upgraded because virtue is excellence and everything around about you starts to become excellent. Listen, your world needs to change. I say your world needs to change. Your workplace, your job, the way you do business, your relationship, husband and wife, children, family, church, members, the world out there needs to change because of the glory of God that's on the inside of you. You must understand there's a weightiness that you carry, the image. There's a weightiness that you carry, the image. The, the, where you've been transformed into, that image. And where that image presents itself, everything must line up where the kingdom come. That's where God's kingdom come. That's where it's on the earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The earth must become and must start to look like heaven. That's why Deuteronomy says, I want you to have days of heaven upon the earth. Doesn't mean you're not going to have struggles. But the struggles are going to be, and the trials and tests are going to be, and it could be the test of the changing of your nature. It's going to show the circumstances that you've been transformed and changed into an image. And you're not going to lower your standards, but you're going to cause the higher nature to manifest itself in those circumstances. So don't let your circumstances start to speak so loud to you that it pulls you down into the earth dimension. Rule from the heavenlies. Because you are seated with Christ Jesus. Rule from that dimension. Know you have the authority. Why? Because you're in the image and likeness of Him that has created us. I love you. God bless you.